Welcome to the second season of True Crime Niger. In this season, we bring you stories of crimes that happen not only in Nigeria, but also across Africa. We hope that by sharing these stories, we all become more aware of the types of crimes that happen here. And by becoming aware, we become smarter at detecting and hopefully preventing similar crimes. This episode and other episodes of True Crime Niger can be found on our 234 Audio YouTube channel, on Apple Podcast, Google Podcast, Spotify, TuneIn Radio, and wherever you get your podcasts. Okay, let's get started. Al Haji Kabir, if you want your son, pay us now. I want to speak with my son. I need to know he's still alive. Baba? Mohammed, Mohammed, are you okay? Baba, please, please give them the money. Mohammed, it's okay. Don't worry. I promise I will give them the money. I have money. Baba, please, they say if you don't pay. They will kill me, Baba, please. Mohammed, I promise they will not kill you. Give them the phone, let me talk to them. Baba, they said they don't want to talk. They want the money, Baba, please. I will pay them. They won't... Hello? Hello? Mohammed, hello? Hi, I'm Antonietta. I'm Richard. And I'm John. And this story, this story, this story could save your life. It's Friday, April 23rd, 2021. And Kabir Mohammed Magayaki has just finished the evening prayer and he's relaxing in his room. Kabir is a man probably in his 40s or 50s. He's a car dealer in Baderawa, a small town located in Kaduna City, under Kaduna North Local Government Area. He lives with his family in a fairly large house. That evening, as Kabir is relaxing in one section of the house, it starts to drizzle rain outside. He hears his wife calling out for their five-year-old son, Mohammed, to come inside from the rain. Mohammed! 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 Her voice trails off and then eventually the calling stops. A few minutes later, a voice is heard asking, Alhaji Kabir, is Mohammed with you? No, Mohammed is not here with me. Is he still outside? No, we've checked. He's not outside and he's not in the compound. Wait, where was Mohammed? Well, at this point, no one knows. All the family knows is that earlier that evening, around 6.30 p.m., Mohammed had left the house and gone to the neighbor's house. Now, Kabiri thought he had returned and was with his mother. Why the mother thought Mohammed had returned and was with the father? As soon as Mohammed's parents notice he isn't anywhere in the compound, they go to the neighbor's house to check. Perhaps Mohammed never left the neighbors. Okay, yes, maybe because of the weather, he was told by someone to stay back. Exactly what Kabir thought. According to Kabir, Mohammed had only three close friends that he visited regularly. These friends all live close by. So the family goes to the friends' houses to check if Mohammed was there. <laughs> The first house they go to is the Al Hazai house. Is Mohammed with you? No, we sent him back before the rain started. At this point, Kabiru and his family are worried. I'm sure they are. They then check the other houses, but no one could tell them where Mohammed is. Oh God. At this point, the clock had already struck 11 p.m. and it's raining heavily. Kabir and his family decide to go back home and continue the search the next day. (laughs) 
The next morning, which is Saturday the 24th of April, Kabir's neighbors and friends joined him to help look for Muhammad. They begin by searching for Muhammad around the neighborhood. Meanwhile, Kabir reports the case to the police, but they tell him that they would only act after 24 hours. What? Even for a five-year-old? That's what I thought too. I would have thought that the police are required to act immediately when they find out about a missing person, especially a child. But nope, Kabir and the family were told they would have to wait for 24 hours to make an official report. Anyway, that does not stop Kabir from searching for his son. He sends people to different areas around town to look for Muhammad. He even goes to popular radio stations in the area to broadcast that his son is missing. Kabir searches and searches for almost the whole day. No sign of Muhammad. Around 4.15 in the afternoon, he goes home to eat his food and say his mid-afternoon prayers. Kabir is a Muslim and Muslims pray five times a day. So this is the third prayer for the day. After performing his prayers with his friend, Kabir receives a phone call. It's from a private number. Because the number is hidden, he ignores the call. Well, I would do the same. I mean, I never pick a call from a hidden number. I'm very suspicious. Now, after ignoring it twice, his phone rings again. But this time, the number is showing 081-4346. 5568. Kabir picks up. Pay your 30 million naira if you want to see your son. What? Kabir is in shock by this. And before he could catch his breath, he gets another call from the same number. Alhaji Kabir, do you want to see your son? Yes. Get your money ready. After that initial call, Kabir tried and tried to call the number back several times. But his calls did not go through. On Monday the 26th of April, that's two days after the first call from the kidnapper, Kabir gets another call, this time from a different number. The caller tells him to bring the 30 million naira if he wants to see his son alive. Kabir tries to negotiate the money, telling them that 30 million naira is a lot of money. That's about $75,000, right? Right. At the exchange rate of 400 naira per dollar. So at this point, when he tries to negotiate, the kidnapper tells Kabir that they actually never intended to kidnap Muhammad. What? I don't understand. They were actually targeting Kabir's older son, Muhammad's brother, who is 20 years old. According to the kidnappers, they had actually been keeping track of this older son's movements. They had details of where the older son would be, how he was going, the car he was using, and they also knew the time. Does that mean they were watching his family? Yes, I think so. God, this is scary. I know. Kabir continues to negotiate. 30 million is too much. Oga, please reconsider and bring back my son. Okay, bring 28 million. Hold on, you can speak to your son. Wait, even the 28 million you're asking for, I don't have. But then the kidnapper says something that stops Kabir cool. Alhaji Kabiru Kara Motus, the Kadila. Kabir is in shock when he hears this. Only people who know him and where he works know this name. At this point, Kabir is furious. But his friends who were around him managed to calm him down. I'm glad that you know what I do for a living. Please reconsider what you are asking from me. You can pay us 25 million. With the way things are in the country right now, I don't have 25 million. How much can you pay? 500,000. 500,000? What is 500,000? What's rubbish? This 500,000 is something that I can spend in less than one hour. The last amount I'm willing to collect is 15 million naira. The next afternoon, that's Tuesday the 27th of April, Kabir gets a visit from a man named Abdul Hamid, 
who might have been a family friend. After exchanging pleasantries, Abdul Hamid pulls out his phone and shows Kabir a picture. Kabir's son, Mohammed has been missing since Saturday, the 23rd of April. Kabir has been contacted by someone who says they have kidnapped Mohammed and they want a ransom for his return. As Kabir is negotiating with the kidnapper, he gets a visit from a friend. During the visit, the friend pulls out a phone to show Kabir a picture. What is in the picture? The picture shows his son, Mohammed, along with a man Kabir knows as Sani. Wait, what? Who is Sani? Sani is the councillor's brother. So in Nigeria, every local government has councillors who oversee villages and represent the local community in decision making. And this guy, Sani, is the councillor's brother, so he's known by the people around. Yes, and that's not all. The picture was taken by someone who lives in Kano State. Remember that Kabir and his family are in Kaduna, a different state. Right, okay. So somehow Sani and Mohammed are together in Kano State, and someone took a picture of them together. Did the person who took the picture go to the police? Well, according to what Abdul Hamid told Kabir, the person who took the picture was scared of what Sani would do to him. Wow, so this guy Sani must be very dangerous. Yeah, well, he's the councillor's brother, so he's politically connected. But get this, he was also a former soldier in the army. He was a lance corporal. He was dismissed in 2013 after a court martial in a case of attempted murder. What? And they let this guy out into the general population? Yes, just like that. So the person who took the picture did not want to get involved. But he did also get the plate number of the car they were driving. And when Kabil gets this information, he immediately forwards the picture to the police. Kabil has been sending the police the phone numbers of the kidnappers and he had been keeping them updated each time they spoke. What did the police do? Did they try to find the person who took the picture? Well, we don't know if they found the person who took the picture in Kano or not. All we know was that after the picture was shown to the police, they asked Kabir if he had Sani's number so that they could use it to track his movement. Kabir did not have Sani's number at the time, but later that day, he manages to get the number for friends who know Sani. After getting the number, Kabil tries to call, but it doesn't go through. The police then punch the number into the True Caller app to see the name that was registered on the number. And get this, the name that pops up wasn't Sani. What? The name they got was Adamu Galadima. Who is Adamu Galadima? It turns out that Sani also goes by the name Adamu Galadima. That's his birth name, but he is better known as Sani. While he was still at the police station, Kabil gets a call from the kidnappers. This time, the police were ready. They tell Kabil to ignore the phone call until they could trace the number. After the police get what they needed, Kabil picks up the call. And this is when he hears Mohammed pleading for him to pay the money or the men would kill him. Kabir assures the son that he wouldn't die in their hands and that he's going to pay. Wow, this is heartbreaking. Was this the phone call we had in the beginning? Yes, the reenactment. So at this point, Kabir is crushed. All he wants is his son back. The kidnapper calls Kabir the next day. Wednesday and tells him to bring any amount of money he has. Kabir tells them he has only a million naira, which they agreed to take. Bring the money to Kaduna Airport Road. No, I know that road. It's deserted and dangerous. You have my son, I won't put myself at risk as well. Fine, take the money to Jim Harrison Hotel. Jim Harrison Hotel is a hotel in Zaria, which is a city in Kaduna. Kabir agrees to take the money there, but before heading out, he calls the police to inform them and to ask what he should do. The police advise him to go ahead and pay the kidnappers, and they also told him not to worry because they were tracking the kidnapper. Hmm. But wait, so at this point, they are tracking Sunny's number, right? Right. So we think it's actually Sunny that Kabir is going to meet. Exactly. Okay, but I thought Sani was in Kano. 
that's where that picture was taken of Sunny together with Mohammed, right? Yes, but Kano is close to Zaria, like a four hour drive. So it's possible that Sunny drove back to Zaria to collect the money. Okay, well, did the police at least go with him to help secure his safety? Or wait, if they could track Sunny, did they try to arrest him? Well, we don't know for sure, but from what we could find, Kabir was not accompanied by the police when he went to drop the payment. And it doesn't seem like the police attempted to make an arrest at this point. So Kabir arrives at Jim Harrison Hotel and he stays in his car as instructed by the kidnapper. He was told to lower his windows and drop the money. But was he able to see their faces? No. And after dropping the money, the kidnapper calls him to confirm that they had the money and that they would call him later to tell him where to pick up his son. Kabir drove back home and he and his family waited for the kidnapper's call. But they waited and waited. Oh no. Call never came. The next morning, it's Thursday and some of Kabir's friends visit him and they tell him that they saw Sani. What? Kabir immediately calls the police and reports where his friends said they saw Sani. But Kabir does not wait for the police. He goes to the local vigilante office to get some help, but there was no one there. So instead, Kabir gets his son and some friends and they drive over to where Sani was reported to have been seen. When they arrived, the police were also pulling in. The police arrest Sani. Thank God, they can finally find Mohammed. After the arrest, Kabil goes back home where he gets a suspicious call. That's not good. It's not. The person on the call tells him that the person who kidnapped his son was his neighbor, Nazifi, from the al Hazei house. What? al Hazei house? Wasn't that the house Mohammed visited before he was kidnapped? Yes. According to Daily Trust, Nazifi was the next door neighbor from that house. So Kabil calls the police, who then arrest Nazifi. And remember, they also have Sani in their custody. According to Kabir, the police find out that Muhammad was taken and left at a kiosk or concession stand somewhere in Kanu. Okay, great. So we have a location now. Yes. So that same day, Thursday, Kabir and the police drive to Kanu and they get there around 6.30 p.m. They find the kiosk and meet with the owner who tells them Sani came to the kiosk with a five-year-old. All they did was buy a bottle of coke from him and after they finished drinking it, they left. Wow. The police continue their investigation, which leads them to a woman, Amina, who confirms that Sani brought a young boy, Mohammed, to her house, where he spent two days. According to Daily Trust, Amina agreed to house the boy because Sani told her the boy was his late brother's son, whose mother could not keep him. But now she doesn't know where Mohammed is. The police continued to interrogate Sani, but he would not tell them where Mohammed was. So at this point, the Kanu Commissioner of Police gets involved and orders that Sani be taken to the anti-kidnapping office in Kano. Kabir goes with them, but he's asked to wait outside while they interrogate Sani. Kabir paces back and forth anxiously waiting for them to come out and tell him where his son is. Within five minutes of interrogating Sunny, the anti-kidnapping officers come out. <laughs> Kabir already knows what they are going to say. I'm sorry, sir. He has confessed. Your son is dead. This news broke Kabir and his family. Now, the police are still investigating the case. They believe that at least four people were involved. The neighbor Nazifi, the woman named Amina, Sani, and one other guy named Omar. Wait, Omar? That's a name out of nowhere. Right. According to Daily Trust, the police believe that Nazifi, the neighbor, lured Muhammad to the house and then sent him on an errand where Sani was waiting to kidnap him. Then Sani started to transport Muhammad to Kanu, but they stopped over in Zaria, 
where Muhammad was left with Amina. From Zaria, Muhammad was taken to Kanu, which is where he was killed. Now, the police are still not sure which of the three, Uma, Sani, or Nazifi, actually killed Muhammad. According to Sani, he only held Muhammad's leg while Uma suffocated the young boy. But according to Uma, his only role was to negotiate with Kabil and collect the money. His share was 150,000 naira. And Nazifi has denied any and all involvement. He claims he's been framed. But Sani and Uma both allege that Nazifi was the mastermind and that he's the reason why Muhammad had to die. Yeah, because Muhammad would report that Nasifi was the one who sent him on the errand, right? Right. So according to Sani and Uma, that's why Nasifi ordered them to kill Muhammad. So they killed him that very same day that they collected the ransom money and dumped his body in a drainage, which is where he was found. How much did they collect? One million naira. That's only $2,500. Yes for the life of a five-year-old boy who did absolutely nothing to anyone. This case is so sad and it makes me mad. The person who took the picture of Mohammed with Sani, I know he was scared of Sani, but was there no way he could have given the police the information secretly? Like an anonymous tip? Yes, maybe that's why he sends the picture to the guy in Kaduna. That's true, but still, they needed someone to get that information to the police quickly. In cases of child abduction, time really is very critical. And the police in this case, I think maybe waiting 24 hours was too long. That was critical time lost, you know? And I can't figure out why they didn't go with Kabir when he went to drop off the ransom money. And if they were tracing Sani's movement, couldn't they have arrested him before or after he picked up the ransom payment? I know, I was wondering the same thing. But you know what? Kabir really tried. He did everything he could to save his son, and in the end, his persistence was the reason why Muhammad was eventually found. I don't really think there was anything Kabir and his family could have done to prevent this. So parents, hug your children a little tighter tonight. And tell them you love them. Join us next week for another episode of True Crime Niger. This time, we take you to Uganda, where police were able to solve two mysteries that seemed unconnected. True Crime Niger is a Triple E Media production. Production copyright 2021 Triple E Media Productions. This episode of True Crime Niger was produced by John Iwodi, Antonietta Kalunta, Richard Anyebe, Nico Rivers, and Sam Tibakaji. Executive producer, Ramat Muhammad. Special thanks to Rabia Hadeja and Mala Iwa Padu Ikaliku. Stay alert, stay alive, see you next week.